Hello everyone, today we talk about the 13 years of Byzantine history between the end of Michael V uh, and the one of Constantine the, the, the Ninth Mon Monomachus reigns. Um, this is important enough both because of the social uh, and uh, cultural dynamics of this uh, last peak, let's say, of the uh, Macedonian Renaissance. Um, the great schism between the East and the West actually at the time was not really perceived uh, as a big deal, it was mostly because of the later consequences in the longer run. The uh, persistence of Zeus um, uh, as, a, as a de facto empress um, of uh, Byzantium at least for a while. Uh, and we will talk also about the figure of Michael Seldus, one of the most important men of letters uh, in, in Byzantine history. Uh, this is for our Byzantine, uh, say, ma manualistic Byzantine history series. Uh, we're filling the gaps a little bit between the various planets, the various emperors. We mostly follow that, uh, not entirely, but you know, imperial history, you're basically obliged to do that. And um, hopefully we'll complete the entire picture uh, at some point. All right. So um, we will see Michael V's demise at some point. He had not reigned, uh, but a couple of years, not even. Uh, and the immediate consequence was the, after all, mm, tranquil, serene acceptation of the fact that the throne at this point could be occupied by women. Um, this is an interesting phase. In fact, in Byzantine history, we'll learn now of Zoe of Theodorides, were uh, sisters, um, uh, children of Constantine the Eighth, that had it was uh, Basil the Second's younger brother, and given that uh, their father had not uh, had male hairs. He thought, especially to marry Zoe to um, various, uh, initially to to uh, various pretendants, and uh, Zoe was in fact uh, at her uh, second marriage, like at least uh, her two husbands had died by this point previously, and with uh, Michael V's uh, death, which had reopened, however, for the Macedonian dynasty, the um, say the, the, the continuity uh, it was thought given the, the previous times the fact that Zoe had been quite of a you know political figure she had, we will see her in, in other in other circumstances but that she could even at this point de facto rule Constantinople this is very unusual and uh, anti-traditional meaning that uh, the first of all the Imperium cannot be held by a woman for very specific theological reasons we will talk about it uh, at some point um, but it, it's as if at this point it had come to, to be accepted not even the, the times of the Basilice Irene right this had been quite the, the thing in fact she had never been an empress and technically mm, not even at this point the concept was accepted as such Right, the important was to have a husband, uh, at least having at that point a regent son that she killed, by the way. Um, just to make you understand, of course, uh, what Byzantine politics was concretely about. Um, and um, but um, the idea was always that there had to be a, a man in charge, all right. And at this point, the idea of continuing uh, Mac Macedonian regime by installing uh, Zoe on the throne came as by explicit will of the people and of the magnates that were increasing dramatically, so the latter especially, in um, in charge. Of course, we're talking to the people of Constantinople, uh, while the, the, the empire was becoming an oligarchy, right? And you have, we'll see it better now, now the complete erosion of the, uh, of the centralized system, the basically the collapse of the peasant soldier kind of, concept mechanism that uh, as you know it, the, the Macedonian dynasty is until especially Basil the second hand tried uh, the hard way to to keep um, a standing I made multiple videos about that uh, there is a lot of historiographical debate as you know on whether uh, 
this trend could be reversed in a way. Well, these are exactly the years in which among Byzantinists there is consensus that the system basically um, declined to the point that by the rise of the Comnenians there was practically uh, nothing better to do than actually investing at that point on the further privatization and oligarchization of the empire. Now, Zoe, um, invited, by the way, her sister Theodora um, in the, at the Imperial Palace of Constantinople, and even if there was some conflict between the two, she a agreed with her um, so that for some time the two reigned together. All right. This is again very rare in, in Roman history. Just as you know, in in the in the first half of the, of the third century, it had been some kind of gynecocracy of, of some sort. We will talk about this. Um, and Michael Sellers, that we'll describe in a while, states, um, documenting the times historically, says it was then first time that our time saw the genitalium transforming itself in imperial council right um, and uh, and here it's described as civilians and uh, and the military actually agreeing under the guide of two dames and obeying uh, better to them than to any other virile despot he Michael writes now so th this is not actually a negative or critical take actually uh, it, it that's why you can't say this was a sort of this was perceived as a morally decadent time, as we'll see again, lots of things were going wrong, right? At this point, the Macedonian dynasty was sort of living off uh, inheritance, right? Because of the greater expansion of the further centuries. So this is, this is um, say, a, a time before a big, a deeper crisis and sort of one of tolerance and of uh, general corruption for which to the otherwise, as you know, extremely... Um, crystallized Byzantine traditional society even women could, could be accepted as rulers against again any any theological, historical, traditional custom and belief and doctrine um, and in fact this would end up anyway to be a momentary situation dictated by the current political balance um, in fact there were I'd say uh, Zoe and Theodora had a strained um, so, um, sorority relation. Uh, they had had uh, old uh, issues with one another. So basically the counselors that gravitated uh, respectively one around the other pressed um, so that they would basically substitute uh, each other in a way so that one could prevail uh, over the other. Um, and since there was no other solution, uh, they adopted a sort of uh, third way, that is, inviting the two uh, rulers to marry, to bring a man to power, right? Theodora, that had in the past already been offered this option, refused. So Zoe um, married, yet again, uh, this time... Uh, an old nobleman of Constantinople, Constantine Monomachos, that was liked, uh, at least to those mm, power groups that gravitated around her. The marriage was celebrated on June the 12th, 1042. Uh, it led uh, for the third time uh, uh, at Zoe's husband to the Byzantine throne. That's how it had happened before. Uh, this time, however, it would, would be different as far as Zoe outliving her husband. In fact, she uh, died uh, before him. She passed away at 72 in ar around 1050. We do not know often the, the birthdays of these people, so we do not know... Um, the time exactly where how how old she were or I, I mean how old she was in this case but not exactly the date of her death. So this opens uh, the scene of course for other five years of Constantine's rule, but also in the previous years he had been 
uh, at least formally in charge. Um, Monomachus was, I checked the accent, in Greek it's Monomachus. Right? The, there is this thing, like so many jokes with our professors at universities, because some, um, as far as I know, some accents are even disputed in this very long Byzantine names, but um, this is not particularly long nor complex, but you, you may never know where the accent lays sometimes, we have checked that out before. Um, in any case, the guy was not a particularly relevant sovereign. I mean, interesting things happened during his reign, but he was, let's say, a scarcely relevant uh, or some, a modestly capable personality. Um, the most important things right, occurring at this point in Constantinopolis in history was uh, a new cultural flourishing, as we were saying before. I mean, the, the, the empire was big, uh, as we were saying before, relatively prosper, so the life of Constantinople at this point had consistently risen to to an hegemonic uh, dimension in the empire. I mean, the only true city, as as you know, was the Salonica, right? The other centers had been absorbed by this system, was increasingly also privatizing through the Constantinopolitan Okayak as control over the various provinces of the empire. That's what would be used especially by the Komnenoi to concentrate power further in this regard. Would have a, a cultural flourishing, in fact. Um, the negatives of this um, are to be found um, within the military system, rather. Right? You have basically at this point, as we were anticipating, the disappearance of a true, we can't say Byzantine national army, I mean, it's, it's not correct to of course, treat the Byzantine Empire as a national empire uh, in spite of the um, Hellenic dominance, culturally speaking. The, the fact that the, the Aegean coastline had remained fundamentally the center since uh, even before the Roman Empire itself, the, the major output of, say, the major strongholds and uh, centers of power in the first place. Um, but the say the nationality here is truly Roman, right? As they understood it, the Romaioi, meaning the possibility through in fact this coastland to exercise enough control on the interland population so that you could basically levy them in case of war, and having a centralized system like it had been, it had been surviving, uh, changing but fundamentally a bit the same since uh, the ancient world. Right, so a, a bureaucratic machine that was able again to supply, train uh, these troops, and uh, having properly a control from the center. Um, as you know, there had already been uh, problems of different sorts, especially with the provincial armies that had been threatening also to, as it happened historically, to, to usurp power in Constantinople, but obviously and un unavoidably ruling from there, whoever the provincials were in that case. Um, with the establishment, actually, of a Constantinopolitan army of sort that would check the same. But the problem is that this system cost too much to some extent, and or at least there were no, so there was no parachute, there was no check, no, no real control on the ways this enormous state um, uh, could uh, prevent itself from, say, giving way to more private systems. Uh, and this had occurred because of the truly uncontrollable development of large estates, of the latifundium, if you want. Um, and uh, we will see it now better. Uh, and the other big deal was the fracture, the definitive schism separating Rome and Constantinople which had had strained relations, as you know, basically ever since they they had existed, at least when we speak ecclesiastical history, uh, but in a broader sense as well. I mean, never underestimate how much Rome and Constantinople were distant, even in the moment to which Constantinople was was founded. Uh, in itself, in fact, Constantine really wanted to, to pull out of, of, of the Roman senatorial policy. But uh, throughout the centuries, uh, it was evident that not just the Byzantines had lost Rome, especially from Carolingian times, even though it was already from 
essentially a couple centuries that um, the actual imperial grip on on the orbs had you know disappeared like the, the Rome was ruled by the local nobility and and the papacy was its expression and it's the spiritual magnitude uh, of the orbs even before the Gregorian reforms that were about to kick in at this point um, lays all in the in the Latin Germanic West in the particular M morality and, and culture of the dramatically underappreciated um, early medieval Western European Middle Ages. I say that, you know, that I love Byzantine history, I like making this videos, but um, I think for, for some reason out there uh, in pop culture, people got inexplicably obsessed. This happens, different phenomena. Like, we, when we discovered that we didn't study Byzantine history enough. Of course, historiography came back and said, oh, look, there is all this pool of stuff let's study it, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world. Uh, this really thinks, you know, Oxford and Cambridge being the, the ultimate step, you know, from Greek and, and uh, Roman civilization, uh, historiographically and literary-wise. Uh, but especially video games, like, at least on, on YouTube, if we talk about the main interest for Byzantine history, I th I'm deeply convinced um, as a historian, but as, as a former gamer, that uh, the Total War series had something specific to do with that, uh, and uh, especially with Generation Z, uh, perhaps, or, you know, the later, the latest millennials, not really getting, like, being hyper-hyped for, for the Byzantines, saying, oh, they're not called Byzantines, they're called Romans, for real, not even getting properly the entire historical background, and yes, I made a lot of videos but to explaining exactly what I mean here, so, um, I, you know, I would be very kind of you if, if you wanted to uh, to engage in, in this discourse, at least watch uh, what I had to say about that, because it's not an obvious situation. It's, you, know, you you don't get away by saying, not because they call themselves Romans, right? That's not exactly how it works. Um, also because to them, it really meant a different thing compared to, say, throughout their own, the same Byzantine history, but um, also compared to archaic times, mostly not the Romanity in itself, but the true meaning of the Imperium as such, and that is really important as far as the ethnos, the Roman ethnos is also concerned, um, so it's not that simple as one uh, assumes um, in any case east and west uh, were importantly distant since ever within the same Roman Empire even at the peak of its power were of course close uh, realities culturally in the broader Mediterranean European dimension but within it they were also very very distant uh, as such, and we tend to inexplicably um, underestimate Western potential just by saying, oh, look, well, the Byzantines were cooler because they had an empire, you know, it's a empire. It's not exactly um, the, right, the the only term of comparison, nor we should understand there what, what empires we're talking about, because, yes, there was a Roman Empire also in the West at this point. And it's not a, a joke, unless you don't want to buy into the, in fact, Byzantine legalism, which is part of that crystallization that sort of killed that magnificent connubium between Roman and, um, say, between Latin and Hellenic cultures that especially had its peak by the Justinian times, right? And then went more downhill in a more Eastern sense uh, because of all the issues, of course, not just of a deterministic reason, but there are already at that point radical, and I stress radical differences that between East and Western society that uh, do not make these particularly shiny um, overall. But we will talk about it. I have a massive Byzantine history playlist. I voiced my um, my opinions on that, so that's also a, an important uh part to start from at least if you're interested in my personal insight. Now the uh, cultural flourishing we were discussing uh, followed essentially the decadence under the military regime of Basil II. It was marked in 1045 by the uh, establishment in Constantinople 
of a philosophy and law university it was very important and a great accomplishment in the 11th century uh, European culture and the first director of this university was Michael Psellus the uh, greatest um, the most learned man of his time that um, took up the title in fact of Consul of, of the Philosophers very also in fact um, classically echoing um, definition considered that philosophy had been repressed by the, the true af affirmation of the, the hardcore Byzantine identity in Justinian end times with the shutting down of the Athenian uh, school and all this stuff but in this sense in fact we are looking at a completely different kind of philosophy um, more like a further inquiring what were the, the pillars of um, in fact of uh, of Byzantine culture, right? The Christianity, Romanity, uh, Hellenic uh, culture, a mix, a synthesis of the three. Um, the f uh, faculty of law was entrusted to the famous uh, lawyer John Xiphilinus. It was important for such a large empire to have greater legal, um, say, insight and capacity look at what the westerners were doing at this point they were recovering roman law from the justinian and texts um the byzantine empire had undergone its changes i will make a video about byzantine law after because we always talk about you know the how we uh, how the corpus juris civilis was issued with the pragmatica sansu in italy and uh, back in the day and then the Bolognese student re recovered Roman law. What about Roman law in, in the Byzantine Empire? That That's a hell of a, a topic that is also poorly studied. Also because we do not know too much. That's part of the reason. As most things Byzantines at this point, Byzantine at this point, because of that social divide that I was talking about. Um, so the success of the literary studies promoted by Psellus um, definitely boosted further a particular element of the three that we uh, uh, listed before that was in fact the last, the Hellenic one right, there was a sense even though Greek um, still meant basically pagan as uh, in, in Byzantine mentality at this point um, and it wasn't even just the, simply the prevalent culture I mean, in a demographic sense um, of course the Byzantine world was Greek, right? It was prevalently in, in language. Yes, it was heavily Latinized in certain, especially bureaucratic and military terms. The empire was truly uh, the one of the Romans. Um, you could see that. But and so Hellenic culture had not been um, reintegrated, especially as far as the classical pagan past was concerned, right? Um, and in fact, in Sellus times, what you see is a sort of humanism characterized by a certain level of laicism as well, which the Byzantine church was not happy at all, right? They were quite suspicious about this. It's only in the later, in the late Middle Ages that the Byzantines, in, in some humanistic context, mostly modeled at that point by the Italian one, and not the other way around, as most people surprisingly believe, um, began to call themselves like a bit Hel Hellenics, uh, Greeks, um, in a yeah, at that point in a national sense, you see, but at this point the empire was traditional enough to say, "Don't no, we are the Romans and we are an, a, the universal empire." So this, w what's the point now of resuming a bit more of this classical attention towards uh, the Hellenic mentality to core and not the, the broader classical one? Um, in, in a mostly in a Roman oriented sense, right? That's a very complex topic we'll have to discuss at some other point. It's obvious, again, that the Byzantines maintained a degree of pride in their Greekness, uh, but they weren't clothed in it like, in fact, an Hellenic vest to court. It was still part of their Romanity that was founded on tradition. This continues handing down something that had been established once upon a time, so had to be like that. Right, say the Franks of the Crusades passing by Constantinople were not the French, they were the Celts, 
Why? Because even if they had barely any knowledge of Celt, but back in the day when Caesar conquered Gaul, those were Celts, and so it must have been, you know, from Augustan times, like the world had remained the same, right? That, that, that was at least the perfect world. If there is something wrong today, it's a sort of a further aberration. We keep calling those guys the Celts. Uh, ask Anna Komnena, so it's quite, uh, it's quite fascinating. But it's also just a literary thing, right? It's very classicistic attitude. Not and, and, and the one of the Byzantine elite that admittedly controlled it, ran the entire system. Of course, the Byzantine Empire in itself was an incredibly more complex and articulated thing, also from a cultural point of view. Just yesterday we were talking about the, the massive numbers, up to one-fourth of Armenians in, in the Byzantine military, around this time, which really speak uh, by themselves, right? So this is a bit what I try to leave out of the series. It's 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 the the complexity in, of, of this system to control other peoples as well, right? Not much. In fact, the sort of nationalistic uh, inside or outside the border, like we are here, we are uh, respectively Romans or not Romans, right? It that there was a an identity of that kind, but it was also in part eroded, right? Because there were some peoples that have even been brought down by force, as you know. Uh, think about the Bulgarians, like during the time of Basil the Second, etc. Made multiple videos about these topics recently, both the Armenians, the Polishians, and uh, the Bulgarians, and how they had coped with the Bogomils, they had part brought down the the first empire and so on. But in any case, um, Michael Sellis is, is definitely a fascinating figure. He lived between 1018 and 1078. Hell of a uh, time span for Byzantine history. He is definitely at least one of the most eminent figures in Byzantine culture. He was a um, native of Constantinople, I think. For some time, he was a public functionary. Then he ran um, a school that was destined to be, as we've seen, of enormous success. But he was also a statesman, as it often happens. He couldn't, he couldn't be otherwise. Right? It was not a, a court in a simply feudalistic sense. These guys were still involved, in fact, in the public administration. He participated. That's why he's a hell of a source for, for the time being, as we've seen, actively to the events of his times. He also was in fact a uh, political arbiter of the uh, of uh, of the empire right with weak sovereigns such as Constantine the seventh or Michael the seventh um, his uh, literary activity is connected with uh, multiple works that manifest uh, his interest and knowledge in the most uh, different uh, topics uh, the Say that it's worth mentioning definitely as the um, say from a historiographical point of view his chronographia that talks about the imperial history fundamentally between the 10th and the 11th century uh, much of which as we've seen the author was uh, eyewitness or even protagonist so that's why uh, we are so lucky for for having his work. Um, and as we just pointed out regarding the new pneuma that was mm, sort of mm, acting, moving, uh, being felt within Constantinople, we uh, see how Sallus' historical work is distant from the most typical Byzantine tradition. In fact, traditional Byzantine histories were very detached, impersonal, right? They tended to represent that, again, idea of fixed order, uh, natural uh, sequence, right? Uh, from emperor to emperor, like uh, in a, in a almost discalic or at least um, sort of solemn way. Um, Sellus is instead very interested in a especially deeper uh, psychological insight 
uh, the main characters, there is a psychological analysis uh, that he carries out to add a bit the sort of depth there. And it's um it's a style that will develop later on. I mean, the same Byzantine world was uh, reviving, like as you see in the West with more chronicles, a sort of more um, a humanistic approach uh, to some extent there too. Like there is obviously some greater attention to the uh, to details, to in-depth, uh, you know, uh, char characters, um, analysis, in fact, uh, criticism, etc. So that that's uh, partly that Silas shows us how this would occur in the Byzantine way, right? Still, they are very Byzantine sources in many ways, but you can't perceive that opening there. And, and together with that, actually a part of what we were saying before, so the sort of courtly dimension, Silas, as we've seen, was actually involved, right, in, in politics and quite powerfully and directly, but later on, right, in Comnenian times, that oligarchic privatistic system will tend to uh, oust, in a way, the, let's say, other elements from power, so you will notice that Byzantine histories are written by people who are a bit more uh, aside from from the system. Salus, actually, even if you consider previous Byzantine literature, is very involved, right? Uh, if you read Procopius, that was also, of course, at the Byzantine court, um, you realize that aside from the disputes regarding, you know, the double, the first, the, the pro-Justinian and then the anti-Justinian work and how it circulated, what it was actually him uh, who wrote that, sort of more distant, was sort of more drawing a picture from, from the external almost, different times, right? Celus is instead within the system. And it also adds, however, some narratives that will eventually remain, even in, in a more detached, uh, or at least in a more distant uh, context by observers who kept visiting the court, but were not really just so part within it. Um, so speaking of the military crisis we hinted at before, um, really the main change in the dissolution of a statal army is the is in the disappearance of the thematic army that was substituted by mercenaries this was um, a long-term process that however in these years comes to its full uh, consequences the thematic armies as we've seen have been threatening for the same Constantinople that had to keep with a more robust force but um, the let's say the gradual absorption of the oligarchy the, the cooptation of the same oligarchy even within the same provinces where again large estates owners were ever more powerful in their own regard um, tends to gravitate around Constantinople tends to uh, you know push for these magnates to, to have a role uh, entrusted also by, by the, the emperor, right? And this happens through a process of also of monetization of, um, let's say, less reliance on the local traditional levy system, as we will see now for social problems, but also for just the, the fluidification of the system. I mean, Constantinople is ever bigger, it has always more power of money. So obviously, and spontaneously, more troops are going to gravitate around that. And especially those that, as we've seen, for example, yesterday with the Armenians, but I made multiple videos about Byzantine auxiliaries at this time, think about all the, the steppes peoples uh, in, the, uh, in, in Pontic region especially, uh, just being hired um, so en masse really you as horse archers um, very cheap but very effective especially against other enemies uh, say enemies that were essentially like them it's a very complicated topic it's not really that but the Byzantine military disappeared as such right the mercenarization has to do mostly with the 
sort of contingent availability of wealth and capacity of hiring troops within the same Byzantine society, uh, rather than um, these being simply cultivated structurally uh, at a local level and then being sent to Constantinople from which a pay should have arrived in part aside from the fact that they were already from an important time since ever actually being paid in part at least by the local magnates uh, etc. Um, the civilians in power by the way uh, intentionally weakened the Statal army uh, and this was done essentially to contain the rivaling military aristocracy because they thought that if they had despoiled them of these institutional contexts, uh, posts, offices, they would have essentially had less, at least legal, um, options to, um, to, to try to take over, right? But um, this system would not be that effective in that sense, at least other usurpers would rise in the first place because the same oligarchs were transforming their private armies into in fact uh, into a mercenary system uh, and all this while there was basically no capacity uh, anymore no effort really no strength to try to salvage the system of the soldiers colonists these were not just uh, historically local peasants uh, living within the again the Byzantine boundaries, they had at some point been even foreigners that were useful to counter, in fact, even the local uh, aristocracies to say, okay, we settle you here. You're basically depending just on us as emperors, and so the the local aristocrats will have to adapt to that, and you will fight for us. Um, naturally, this could last just for so long because eventually these people would be absorbed in the system in the moment in which you settled them they still territorialized to some extent um, and in the first place they, they were not really favoring this regard to local peasantry so even though some of these people of the latter were instructed framed as levies etc they had it worked on base of village systems etc all this had been undermined by the development of the latifundia that were expanding dramatically. Plus, at this point, because of the political military difficulties, there are taxes imposed by Constantine the Ninth, and um, as such, uh, you know, there is a general depression. Uh, there is the concession, also the possibility of exemption from the military service in exchange for some money or natural uh, goods, let's say, and this contributes the peasantry to distance itself from the military service itself, to lose essentially their autonomy, their combativeness, and, and to end up under the, the aristocracy or the, the tax system. And the, the two systems were in fact also hybridizing right uh that's what happens in Comnenian times you have just aristocrats ruling everything but they are connected with the provinces as much as they are with the city uh, that is sort of the meeting point politically um thus um since the this brought even to further money available uh, that were not invested in the previous military system mercenary recruitment that was ad hoc as you understand became predominant. So the, the so-called national army, this, okay, it's not a good term, but say the statal army ended up for dissolving, right? You you recruited troops as long as you needed that. You didn't have to keep many of the archers, you could settle them um, and uh, in some depopulated areas or wherever you, you would. Um, and this kept attracting uh, even interesting figures, I mean, the Comnenians made a very good use of that, especially Manuel, um, in terms of attempting a feudalization of the empire on the Frankish model, um, which met naturally with a lot of resistance by the Byzantine uh, oligarchs. But that also settled lots of, in fact, Western knights in the empire, as it's notorious, 
and that made still the empire at the time so powerful. There was a huge debate on whether, again, that would have been the, the right thing if the empire had both immediately, let's say, from uh, Alexis the first times uh, onwards without resistance to this model, if the, the empire would have survived the crusaders. Um, but that's also sort of uninteresting. I don't like what-ifs because it's way more interesting to try to sort out what actually happened um, at the time. The um, uh, let's say it, the, the fascinating thing is aside from the fact that there were rebellions at this time different problems the military situation of Constantinople up to the second half of the 11th century remained substantially in a state of balance I made a video about the rise of Alexis Comnenus, the the Normans, the, the Pensionists, all, all the threats that were mounting up we will look at them now uh, yeah, briefly as, uh, as well um, that were successes right they uh, they uh, still reflected the important Macedonian power uh, at this point uh, how it had been built in the previous generations uh, particular victories even of the empire were the reconquest of Edessa from the Arabs in Syria in 1032, the repression of the Bulgarian rebellion of 1041, the defeat of the Russians that in 1043 uh, besieged Constantinople for, by the way, the last time in their history, or the um, temporary reacquisition by the sign of the best Byzantine general um, of, of the time, Georges Maniakis of eastern Sicily in 1038, uh, where the, uh, the Byzantines remained installed until 1042. This is very important. The empires, you know, had undergone a, as we see here, there are, these are the natural routes of expansion, either in the eastern frontier, uh, against the Mas, uh, say, well, in Sicily against the Muslims as well, but in in, uh, say as a broader completion actually of the southern Italian reconquest that however would stall later on favoring I mean in a few years favoring the rise of the Normans as uh, local contractors that took over basically for the Longbirds uh, uh, the, the former Byzantine territories uh, Maniacus really is a great figure he even tried to uh, to take power he came back to to the Balkans he with, with a substantial military force but in an engagement he got wounded and died and so but th there could have been the possibility of Maniacus actually marching on Constantinople overthrowing Constantine the IX and history changing pretty brutally again uh, by the way the Byzantine foothold in Sicily is also quite telling of the softness of the Arabs that had not really developed there much of a compact uh, uh, state, right, in spite of the magnification of, say, Islamic Sicily in, in general terms, it, it was all fragmented. Uh, it's, by the way, during these expeditions that the Normans, you see the Varangians, this Northmen that had been uh, together with the Byzantines, but also serving in southern Italy on the road, that um, enter Sicily, right, before the, the conquest uh, of of, uh, of of the island, the the Otville had already uh, been there, right? As mercenaries, they had already they had supporters in some Islamic emirs there as well. So that's what uh, made them realize, aside from the various events, I made a video about this, especially with the relation with the, with the popes, um, as we will see now, the strained. Um, ecclesiastical relations, the definitions of, of different spheres of influence within the central Mediterranean uh, between Italy and the Balkans significantly would prepare, would pave the way, would make them realize that they could acquire all of that, southern Italy plus Sicily. Um, and in any case, the Byzantines also in this um, frontiers uh, obtained some, as we've seen, some success, but 
Also, they were pretty overstretched. Um, so you can just see this accomplishment as just the exhaustion of the previously achieved uh, Macedonian power that had really paved the way for this as well, but not much because of um, sort of true vision by Constantine the Ninth and most of his generals regarding the further re-expansion of the Roman Empire, right? Um, in fact, we see actually um, uh, in uh, Constantine's times the appearance of what would have become the, the worst nightmares of Constantinople in the following centuries. So first of all, the Seljuk Turks in the, in the east, uh, that as you know were essentially, had escalated, they had emerged from the ashes of the Olgoths, uh, and they had actually contributed backstabbing them, and they had quickly gained power in um, essentially in Western Eurasia, then in Persia, and were swarming uh, in, in the, all across the, the Middle East, they were approaching to the, the Near East as well, exactly where the Byzantines were um, were about to penetrate further in Armenia. This, this is what happened in the further generation with Manzikert, etc. That would lead to, as you know, the disastrous loss of continental Anatolia. Nothing actually repairable, as you know, in Byzantine history. It's very important to stress the Byzantines actually one century later before Mirokeflon had almost reconquered everything. But then they crumbled yet again. And then the Fourth Crusade came and so everything was lost basically later. But actually the, the, the most dangerous enemy by far uh, of the Byzantine Empire notoriously were the Siculo Normans, right? Uh, the Normans uh, I from Italy would mount up, uh, um, I really have a title here that I can address you to because that's what Alexis man uh, Comnenus ma manages to fence them off. Uh, made not so many videos about Normans telling the truth but Yes, the rise to power of Alexis Comnenus, the Norman Pechenek invasions, and the reform of the honor system. That's the video that talks about that phase if you're interested in it. But you know, the Battle of Durak and the, everything is connected here. The Battle of Hastings um, with the Anglo Saxon refugees in the Byzantine Empire among the Varangians. Um, the battle in Epirus, in fact and more, but this, the Sicilians were, in fact, uh, the, the single most threatening power. They, they would manage to take Thessalonica, Corinth, go Trent in the same Constantinople at some point. They, they were by far the power with the greatest strategic projectional capacity. I mean, nothing compared to the Seljuk Turks that in, in Anatolia and the Levant were already pretty stretched just as much as the Byzantines in, in the places where they met them, right? The Normans were just at the threat next door. They could arrive with substantial naval power uh, from the, uh, ironically, in part from the same Byzantine bases, like, you know, the cities in southern Italy, the, the naval, the maritime potential, etc. We'll talk about the Normans better at some point, um, also from a military point of view. And as always in Byzantine history, the other major source, the perennial source of, of issues was uh, the uh, northern steppe, right? Uh, peoples like the Pechenegs, the Uzes, the Kumans, right, would um, substitute basically the Bulgarians and the Rusians as traditional enemies in, the, in that sector, right? And in the following years, they would all inflict heavy losses to the empire. This is also relevant. The Bulgarians had been knocked out, as you know, by Basil II after literally a generation of warfare. It was also pretty costly for the empire, but at least, you know, the first, in, in this Damocles sword of the first Bulgarian empire was taken out properly as a state or what had managed almost to consolidate as just next door to Constantinople. Um, and the Russians, um, as we've seen, uh, are defeated for the last time uh, under Constantinople, they do not attempt that anymore. Now they're Christianized, they sort of maintain very important relations with Constantinople. I recently made a video about Russian warfare, in which we talk a bit also in the areas in which they were more, at this point, oriented for good, mostly in a continental way, right? 
these were the last uh, years which the the Rus had that sort of still Viking vibe, um, so they would attempt this uh, siege of Constantinople that was also not as big as those who could attack it from from land. Um, but uh, the at, at that point, the, Ru- the the Russian principalities settled in Eastern Europe as centrally continental powers, and these other nomads in the south actually are a bit of a belt that are subjected mostly to the Rus, that are just content to control the the mouth of the, gra- the greater riverways of Eastern Europe, and so they wouldn't have much problem or need uh, to expand further there or to to enter in concerts with, with the Byzantines that were basically a major source also of uh, culture, of uh, inputs for civilizational development and so on. Um, so when we look at the uh, t- the collapse of the, uh, st- say, the traditional uh, Byzantine army, the, the, the one that had survived, even though in a very modified way from from Roman times, you can't help but seeing again a, a radical social change as well. It's the landed aristocracy that is rising to power fast and strengthening further, obtaining ever wider privileges from the central government. Yes, you could take out the state, but not the, the rise of these people. So think about this because, uh, as you know, I'm extremely far beyond uh, ultra right. Uh, wing, uh, and exactly for this reason, um, the mere, say, point of eliminating a state, like especially in American conservatism, that the point seems to be everything has to be no state. But do you realize why the state exists? Uh, that is to say, that people are disgusting because they can't handle themselves. Uh, well, that's exactly the point, right? If if you destroy the state, uh, because you live in a country of lesser people. Um, th- those lesser people are going to be taken over much w- anyway, right? Not just because of you destroy the state, but by whoever has to take over. Because you don't have even a counter. In other words, if you're not intelligent enough to handle civilization, because of course you're an underschooled moron, uh, grown up like an animal instead of like than a human being, given the level of parenting nowadays. Um, you're going to be taken over anyway. Right? So it's not self-sabotaging civilization that you will be a better person or that you will have a, a better life. Right? This is not just about Americans, but this is a concept that rings um, uh, quite uh, you know, frequently and a lot also from there uh, because it, it's like a mental illness. I mean, people actually convince themselves that rooting for an extreme has anything to do with their capacity of handling the world, uh, well, they're actually th- the first one we're going to sink further. Right? This is exactly what happened. Here there were very powerful people who were trying to sabotage the state, and the people just were abandoned by the same state, uh, but they also they didn't do anything uh, by themselves, and those who could keep also control on, on that from the state basically failed because they were still pushed by, away by these other privates anyway. Um, so I'm of course for liberty but liberty has uh, you know to do with the capacity of using the tools that in a fallen world you must need in order to to actually govern effectively. Right. So what happened to the Byzantine Empire at this point is a lot of pain um, then it, it's not gonna end, right? Um, while if you look at other states, like in other parts of Europe, you see a, a much different system that was actually going towards a state, a state that eventually succeeded historically, right? So uh, there are different balances. It's not, but I, I know again half of the West fixates with categorism, um, uh, categorism with identitarism. What kind of color are you? What kind of category you fit in, whatever. This is an obsession that um, is actually correlated strictly with mental illnesses. Uh, It has to do with this sort of role play, sort of um, idea of reality fitting in neat boxes and not having to use your brain because you're threatened by complexity and, um, and hard work and standards. And that's not exactly how uh, you're going to be successful at any other point. And 
uh, tragically enough, if you hadn't developed sort of the antibodies for that before your mid twenties at the latest, but more or less if you actually had a, didn't have a normal childhood, well, good luck with that. And this is not to be harsh with with those who you know lead through hell, but just know that uh, this is not going to make it better for you anyway. Actually, it's going to make it worse and also for other people as a consequence. So being self-condescending is not really a, much of a help and history doesn't flatten to your own um, wishful thinking. Um, in any case, um, as we were saying here, the, uh, the, the especially the the oligarchs for here we're getting exempted from from taxes actually they uh, were um, granted uh, legal immunities right so this would undermine uh, the colonists liberty they um, they, 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 they the, the, these people would be judged ever more by their lords directly uh, again it's a. It all. It, it all goes. It, it do, is similar to say. Ah, these are the big corporations. Let's say, yes. But these big corporations form themselves out there in the wild. They succeeded and they sort of knocked out the same state. Under whom do you really want to live? And also, to some extent, are these systems capable of winning? Who does rule them? That's a completely different topic. Has nothing to do with today's video, but. Again, don't make things simple because it's dumb, right? And you're the first colonist to go down in that way. Um, but in any case, it was the agglomeration of large estates that were essentially detaching themselves from the to the to the body of the state, right? Um, the central government, instead uh, of intervening as the Macedons had done, it actually favored the development of the phenomenon. Um, and this led to the expansion of Latifundium, but also the crisis of central power. This, ex this is paralleled by the Pronoia system. Pronoia system, actually, here I researched the accent too. Um, which was, a, say, a milder feudal version compared to the Western one uh, developed in, in the Byzantine world, notoriously basically as a compensation for the services rendered the sovereign would um, grant lands um, for for a given time right the literal meaning of the Greek term pronoia is the the concession as such and this pronoia um, would be given to the to the powerful so that they would administer them by also making some something out of the rent of, of their rent um, the idea is that this wouldn't develop as a full-fledged feudal system like um, in Europe where you had the Alodia you had some places properly that you couldn't touch because they were sort of private like the Byzantine managed to retain at least a certain level of administration from the center meaning that um, let's say this Byzantine Empire's chunks would not drive away from each other. In great part this happened thanks to the fact that, as we explained, Constantinople was the main center you couldn't quite escape from, so yes, there were other provinces that tended to uh, to centrifugal uh, escapism, like, I don't know, think about Trebzon, especially as the uh, when the Turks would swarm into Anatolia and they didn't, they didn't say that the cities didn't have much in continental context so they open more towards the sea towards the external um, but this allowed to a sort of cooptation of this this oligarchs that would be integrated in part in the again Constantinople Sultan system it wouldn't be literally men of state uh, men of state out there ruling principalities like I don't know in France uh, as a different states within a broader a broader territory. I mean, the West was evolving to be more compact and would surpass the Byzantine Empire in that concrete power uh, dimension, but we have to wait for the 12th century, right, for seeing that. 
uh, and when you have in fact the same Byzantines obliterated by this bigger uh, states you can obtain feudal glue, say a uh, statal glue also out of a feudal system but uh, the point is that the, the state had failed half of a millennium before in the West so at this point you couldn't blame the West for having pursued fully a feudal system like the Comnenians uh, as we were saying at the time of their rise they would fundamentally do but the Pranoya was um, still a way to maintain the idea that the emperor existed and the broader Byzantine state as a wall did too even if as we've seen especially the military system had change radically if this old uh, new social conditions were rapidly escalating but it was still a compact system uh, sort of feudal uh, Byzantine feudalism right um, tactically the pronoia was temporary it lasted normally for a lifetime uh, the lifetime of the beneficiary right so for this guy it was about being in, in power in some condition position of power in Constantinople rather than just being again a, a statesman out there uh, literally on its own um, and consider that the Byzantine Empire had evolved up, up to this point after all still from a strongly centralized system right uh, the from the early middle ages this the basis of how the, the empire was ruled were truly the one of the ancient Roman Empire, right? They had already been eroded severely, don't make, get me wrong, late antiquity there was something similar already kicking in, but um, still the institutional basis had not really changed that much and the system was already very centralized because of the early centrality of Constantinople back in the day uh, and that's also what probably allows the system to in fact survive so long because it had a very robust structure and it's sort of complex even to explain how they succeeded um, but I made some videos on it we'll come back on the topic and we'll see it better um, in any case the major change here is that uh, the struggle for power would essentially occur from this rival families coming from the new magnate estates, right? And so, as such, it was easier sort of to, uh, say, to reach even greater positions of power because the older uh, uh, offices had sort of disappeared and so had made room for this much bigger power struggle and there is an increased dynastization uh, that comes with this feudalization as well as again typical uh, among the Comnenians. Finally let's talk about the religious issues between Rome and Constantinople. So as we know uh, the Great Schism of 1054 as it's called was probably the point of arrival of the centuries-old uh, contrast between Rome and Constantinople. This break would in, uh, ex post uh, be irreversible. At the time they wouldn't properly know that. Um, the main issue, at least the contingent issue here, was the intransigence of Pope Leo IX that at that time was backing uh, the uh, Cluniac monastic reform um, and this tells you how much still the let's say the, even though there were de facto two empires how still the idea that there was a single one together with the same church uh, how strong their mentality really was how the popes until the 12th century even in spite of the schism would still consider themselves in part to be part of the Byzantine Empire right I also uh, have a video incoming on the Cluniac reforms to, to understand better what this was about. Um, of course, it was concerning the broader reorganization of Western monasticism ag uh, along the, uh, say, reformed lines that had to make it also easier for the Roman papacy to control. Um, here we are 
on the eve of the St. Gregorian reforms and the papal monarchy. So everything was assuming actually a much bigger, more definite and powerful profile. The Byzantines knew that, right, even if they were not so involved in Western affairs, um, uh, nor they had much of a capacity at this point to simply step into into the heartland at least of Western power would attempt to recover southern Italy in the 12th century, but that was their last, the almost successful enterprise of kicking out the, the, the Normans, basically, but eventually failing and, uh, you know, under Manuel Comnenus. On the other hand, you had the strong figure like the one of Michael Cerularius that had risen to the patriarchal throne of Constantinople in 1043. Uh, the main issue of content at this point was actually southern Italy, right? Uh, the church had always considered, I mean, the, the papacy had always considered uh, southern Italy as a sort of personal possession. It had a, a lot of latifundia there historically, um, there were very complex episcopal policies in southern Italy that differed from the ones of the north um, we'll have to deal with at some point because here it's all about the same rise of the Normans what kind of order did southern Italy have which was very poor because it was all very fragmented right the Normans united southern Italy basically from the times of the, uh, of the Gothic War uh, and uh, in, in the, the ecclesiastical administration had suffered of this. The Byzantines had tried to recover this era. The popes at this point were consolidating a greater power in central Italy. They, they saw this as a threat. That's why the Normans also initially are a threat for the pope, but they allied themselves with it and they are granted. Uh, southern Italy uh, uh, and Sicily, where also lots of previous latifundia had existed, uh, owned by the popes, right, since late antiquity, even though at that point they had changed, of course, under the Muslims, um, were, were established, were created, like how the idea of being a vassal state of the papacy, uh, with the crusade of Sicily, as it technically was, um, the popes, you see, were already developing these universal ideas further, at least in their implementation. The Crusades were not started in 1095, um, but much earlier. Right? Technically, they had always been there because um, they, every single military expedition in the history of mankind was in the name of God, in the history of civilization. Um, and uh, so what happens here is the papal capacity to organize them at, at the relevant international, um, political, and strategic level. Right, so the Byzantines were sort of aware of this. Plus, they had were having problems uh, on the road on the frontiers, and they were agitated that a Western power, through the papacy, could also dislodge them from from southern Italy. That they had spent lots of resources to to recover from the Islamic uh, invasions times. Um, the um, it's very complex to talk about this topic again. I have, I think I've never made a video about the the Great Schism, I noticed just right now. Um, but let's say that the papal presence in Constantinople in an intellectual, spiritual, uh, theological way, especially during debates, legacies, etc., was deeply felt. I mean, the Byzantines did care about what the Roman popes uh, expressed because first of all Rome had the primate of charity Constantinople had never managed to to substitute it nor they could um, factually so um, what the Pope said was of great importance over the Byzantine church it had always been it had played into I don't know the, the conversion of the Bulgarians the in fact the capacity of the popes to even sort of pull away like certain peoples from the Byzantine orbit um, at the beginning of the 11th century when you look at Hungary, Poland falling into the orbit of, of the Roman papacy and of the Ottonian Empire you realize that these are major triumphs of the Western Church over the Constantinopolitan one. So I already, you see, I already 
distinguish them. This is what you find in many books, like even before the Great Schism, you say, well, the Roman Church is one thing, well, because technically it is. I mean, if the, the Bishop of Rome is not the Bishop of Constantinople. But truly, it's, again, two different spiritual, cultural, and um, sort of broader areas, different worldviews, really, at a very deep level. And that's why, to make the long story short, the divides between the two church shifted at, the, at this point also on the dogmatic liturgical level. Uh, and they invested the traditional points of attrition. Uh, first of all, there was one that may seem dumb, uh, as I think, that is the famous filioque issue, right? The, the issue of the, double, uh, of the doctrine of the double procession of the Holy Ghost. Because basically the Westerners translated from the Greek uh, instead, uh, as they should have been proper, that the Holy Spirit perse proceeded uh, ex patre per filium, so from God through Christ, um, ex patre filioque, which means from both the Father and the Son. Um, this is sometimes described as, uh, well, first of all, it, there are still, because technically the Catholics still actually accept both. The Orthodox still today actually have all, of course, the, the original one, the perf uh, ex patria per filium. Um, but in the Catholic Church, both are recognized to be correct. Um, and uh, there is an interesting sort of modern offspin of this, but I'm not going to digress, uh, just in, at least in this video, about that. And actually, the problem seems really that they didn't know how to translate that properly. They made a mistake, and it remained in the doctrine, uh, in the doctrinal text in Latin in the West, expressed like that. And the Byzantines were uh, angered by this; that they at least, you know, used it as a punching point. It was not the only one. There was the um, the issue of fasting on Sunday, for example, the, the priestly marriage, the use of different types of bread in the communion. These were all other very important uh, issues. Also from a theological point of view, the filioque one, however, is a bit theologically more subtle because technically, given that Christ, um, Christ receives actually the paracletus, so uh, at a point in his life, um, so that it is true that, of course, the, the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father to the Son. This is the... I made a video properly on traditional grace and how this works. Um, so in, the, in the European mythology, Catholicism was very pertinent. It was the same religion, even if people do not understand this. Uh, I have still people commenting, uh, but Catholics did not exist before the Great Schism of 1054. Again, good luck with your, you know, um, history of religious uh, studies, uh, to say the least. I'm not going to explain myself because I made so many videos on the topic that I'm not going to uh, assume I have to, you know, make the work for those who are too lazy just to to watch my videos. Um, or just even opening, again, uh, a book of history of Christianity or just an etymological dictionary. But aside from this... Um, the idea is that once Christ, of course, has um, uh, won death, has um, transfigured, uh, he is God himself. I mean, this is present. If you think about Mithras that fights against the sun, but also eventually becomes the sun himself. So technically, um, in the, say, post-resurrection, uh, time, uh, in our time, we are left with technically grace that leaves from Christ as well, right? The Holy Ghost uh, coming from God, from the Father initially, but also in this sense from the, the Son that has his divine nature as well. So this was the main object, I mean, my object of content. Um, so what happened is that in 1054, in Constantinople, a Roman embassy arrived, uh, guided by the Cardinal Umbert of Silva Candida, one of, one of the greatest um, promoters also of the 
papal reforms and we will talk about him we talk about figures like Pierre Damiani etc these are really tough guys um, and in fact very much adverse to the now Byzantine church like what we would call the Orthodox Church uh, which is also improper I mean again the the official name of, of the church since its foundation is Catholic and it always remained the same right so you say Catholic or Orthodox after the um, the great schism it's not technically correct meaning that all the church is Catholic and of course also the, ta the Catholics are Orthodox as much as they understand to be Orthodox so um, you know if you style yourself as an Orthodox the sense uh, it's you have to distinguish between the actual meaning of the word and what it means in a more conventional way that is not necessarily correct but I would not digress on this either um, so what happened is that the Pope had actually died on April 19th and um, even though the Cardinal Umberto knew that uh, on July the 16th he uh, deposited officially the excommunication bow of Michael Cerularius and of his followers basically here you have the Pope excommunicating the Patriarch of Constantinople and this rose an enormous resentment between the clergy and the population of Constantinople uh, which was you see to this extent at least the word national lists even uh, meaning that uh, again a Roman delegation and the Constantinopolis and clergy were two very different things culturally ethnically linguistically I mean they really um, the, all the, the tension all the problems all the disagreements the contempts the sense of themselves was was highlighted here right um, so in spite of the uh, attempts made eventually by the Emperor Constantine the ninth himself in order to arrive to a settlement the Roman ambassadors left Constantinople while a synod summoned by Michael Cerularius um, this confessed officially their work in other words what the Pope said did not matter they the Byzantines said nuts uh, the of course the the the, the papals didn't want to know anything either so this fundamentally br brought to the break between the two churches and in fact if you it, it's I mean of course uh, there are more details here I don't have time in a single video to digress on this but we will see it in other videos but it's literally what happened in practice right so as you can expect it doesn't sound like anything particularly impressive uh, nor it was received as such by the contemporaries. I mean, nobody at the time really said, okay, so from now on we're two separated churches. We are the Orthodox, we are the Catholics. Literally nobody, no one at the time, not even a single person ever thought this, right? First of all, there had been, yes, other issues, but still the world, again, worked according to the idea that Rome was technically still part of the Empire, that this empire had were issues with the westerner uh, say the western rulers still having part of that as well the pope playing uh, with both um, with both powers being at the head of both according to them um, there is th this myth that again 1054 great schism there were people called the orthodox and the catholics counterpopes it, it's something that again literally never existed and technically it's wrong even to think about this today in spite of course how it all ritually um, and you know communally politically the things settled right that are obviously the one of a break but not uh, with the language not with the level of actually the lack of understanding of any theological basis we have today or how we consider this is different cultural areas we're also different cultural areas for very specific reasons. I made a video about uh, right this time which is titled um, you know it's the one about the Byzantine missions in Great Moravian Khazaria actually this talk mostly about the 9th and the 10th century but they exemplify they are explained at least 
the reasons why um, let's say the Byzantines had to go that far <laughs> that point how let's say the, the two spheres of influence surely have to make a better dedicated video um, between the West and the East ecclesiastically speaking why Constantinople went for some peoples and why some peoples in fact settled for them and why the popes uh, for others and fundamentally you know succeeded big time compared to the Byzantines as well there are reasons right this depends on the same peoples uh, it wasn't a passive evangelization at all so uh, again uh, it, it, it's all very very stereotype and I would say in pop culture every time I see any of these differences there are some channels that allegedly specialize in um, in this sort of theological issues and they, they, they don't even go like they don't even dig in the history of it right they just think that there are some teams with some symbols you have to cosplay and so that makes you ah I am this I'm I'm that um, Christianity but Catholicism especially and again if you think that Catholicism is a branch of Christianity again I, I won't even comment on that uh, literally if you do not know that Christianity actually fits into Catholicism which is a bit if you do not understand this forget to basically anything you you think to know historically just know that it does not exist as you think that um, but it's such a totalizing thing that you cannot reduce it to this uh, I mean that's just a mirror of our third millennium degeneration spiritually morally personally you know, there is no now um, in any case the reason why we remember 1054 is because the schism was never recomposed and so this at least has to be considered for the sake of our video the most important event of Constantine the Ninth reign right this would eventually become an epoch making um, issue right of a religious division but uh, if you evaluate it especially from within Constantinople you realize that it was a an episode of strong preeminence of the of patriarchal power that in this time was actually at the peak right even over the sovereign's will as we've seen Constantine tried to fix the schism but he failed um, in fact we mostly think this that again the West has the papacy and the emperor quarreling right um, and so we say ah oh, look at the Byzantines they had such a you know strict control in the patriarchate it is true but this actually are this is the time which actually it's the least true of all meaning that with the 11th century revival in many ways the the patriarchate of Constantinople tried to do something not necessarily similar to what the popes of Rome were doing um, given that by this point they were still relatively obedient even to the Empire but still they um, began to force their uh, their decisions on the emperors which normally had not quite been the case. I mean, emperors had taken even popes and put them to death, had been quite manipulative towards the patriarchate of Constantinople itself. At this point, instead, you have an attempt of autonomization, at least, of, of, of the latter, right? Especially when you look at the strong personality of Michael Cervarius, that surely managed to uh, manipulate, instead, uh, himself the work of Constantine the Ninth as we've seen was not particularly um, you know remarkable sovereign but even when imperial power came back in force with stronger rulers the traditional Caesaropapism that had characterized the empire from Roman times like in, in this control of the church in the east um, during the early the high middle ages would not be the same ever at least um, this there was a change in the uh, racial strength 
strength ratio, excuse me, and um, the Emperor's rude find growing obstacle, um, especially in uh, around this issue, that is to say, properly arriving to a reconciliation with Rome, because the Byzantine emperors did really search for that at some point. They did really search for a coming back in in southern Italy. Uh, if they had succeeded in the 12th century against the Normans, and they were about to, but the, the Normans struck back uh, also with an impressive amphibious, um, you know, a very effective um, strategic capacity, they would have not ruled over Rome. At least from the destruction of the Normans, it's mostly the Pope, let's say with the southern Italy, um, say protected by the Byzantines, uh, it's rather the papacy that would have acquired the, the largest territorial um, political profit, all right? And uh, the, the Byzantines would have not managed to remain in Italy for that long successfully, the popes would have taken over. So in many ways, um, at least they would have knocked out, the popes would have not ever been so dangerous like the secular Normans, but um, and so the the Byzantines would have had they, they could have concentrated more in the east, but um, even about that you realize how distant in a sense from the primal glories right the empire had really was uh, at least the, the eastern one, but, um, yeah that that's it. There's really a lot to say. This is a beautiful topic. Uh, that's why I make so many videos about also very in-depth ones uh, about various eras, sort of political issues, etc. Because you can't truly really understand the period if you do not look at the actual details and contingencies of this whole. If you do not accept a bit more flexibility uh, in the analysis, at least as far as your preconceived notions really are. That's really the most important thing of history, after all, right? Um, for today, however, I stop it here. We'll keep talking about Byzantine history, hopefully. Well, yeah, we all we often do, don't we? I uh, just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.